so um so uh our next next speaker is um uh has dr ruth Nusenoff, who's at, at nih and also at tel aviv university and ruth has really been one of the people thinking very early on and making huge impact in understanding allosterism uh as well as generally in protein structure function modeling and uh the title of her talk is Unraveling Oncogenic Mechanisms and Signaling with Structures. So welcome, Ruth. Thank you very much. And now, do I have the screen? I still, okay. Okay. Now share. How do I minimize it here? Okay, very good. So let me now blow it up. Okay. So it's a big squeeze <laughs> switch from predicting structure, making the structures. And what I'm going to talk, of course, is about using the structures and using the structures to connect, to see how we can connect structures with functions to make sense of function and this function. For example, in disease, and I'm going to focus largely on cancer, but not only on cancer. So the title of my talk is Unraveling Oncogenic Mechanisms and Signaling with Structures. And within this broad framework, why doesn't it move? Oh, and within this broad framework, I'm going to focus on mechanisms in rust signaling pathways in the cytosol and at the membrane. So here is a schematic map of the MAPK pathway. Here we see RAS at the center, proteins that activate it, proteins that inhibit it, and proteins that RAS activate. Such simplified pathway diagrams take a huge amount of time to construct, and they take a huge amount of work and dedication at all. They are also highly informative and provide a very useful overall picture. However, they are still unable to capture the root cause of pathological alteration. So here we see us at the center. We see the proteins that activate it, proteins that inhibit it, and proteins that RAS activates. Still looking at it, we do not understand why different RAS isoforms are observed to work or to function or dysfunction also in different tissues, in different cancers. And why do they show such distinct or preferred distributions of driver mutations in these diseases. Looking at this map, we still do not understand. There are no structures and there are no cell type specific data, which we should not forget is also extremely important. So here is our the structures of the RAS catalytic domain specifically, KRAS G12B, I'm, I'm sorry, KRAS 4B, the inactive and the active states. So the catalytic domains are highly homologous across all. This is not the case for the disordered C terminal hypervariable, which, as the name implies, the sequences are different and they also have different distribution or different combinations of post-translational modifications leading to pref different preferred attachment to membrane microdomains. Our aim is to elucidate the mechanisms of key nodes in oncogenic cross signaling. So there are two major pathways, MEPK and the PI3K, PDK1, AKT, and mTOR. Membrane, RAS PI3K and P10 and PDK1, AKT, RAF, KSR, etc., are also membrane attached. And both pathways consist of cascading phosphorylations by both protein 
kinases and lipid kinases, for example, PI3K, and phosphatases, for example, P10. All are major drug targets. So mechanistic questions in, the onco in oncogenic RAS that we have been asking so far include how is RAS activated at the membrane and how is frenesylated hypervariable tail regulate signaling? Why the differential statistics of its cell type specific isoform expression in distinct cancers? and how to explain the perplexing two-state behavior of KRAS 4A, which behaves both as KRAS 4B in KRAS 4B cancers and in NRAS cancers. What are the mechanisms of specific oncogenic mutations? What are RAS dimeric states? What is the role of calmodulin and why only in KRAS 4B? And what is the detailed mechanism of RAS activation? As to mechanistic questions on nodes in RAS signaling pathways that we have been asking so far, as to RAF, it's a protein kinase, how is RAF auto-inhibited in the presence and absence of the 1433? And how is monomeric RAF V600E, which is the most common uh, commonly observed mutation, except especially in melanoma, activated? What is the detailed mechanism of rough dimer activation as to PI3K lipid kinase, which phosphorylates PIP2 to PI3P3? We're wondering about phosphorylations and mutations in PI3K and P10. Asking, are there passenger phosphorylations? And this is actually a very general question. We know that phosphorylation sites are consensus sequences. We also know that there are multiple kinases in the cell. Is it then possible that there are some phosphorylation site sequences in these consensus sequences, which are phosphorylated by one or more of the kinases which are there, which have no function. We dub this passenger phosphorylation in analogy to, to passenger mutations. How do PI3K driver mutations work? How, what are the features that distinguish between the inactive and active PI3K lipid kinases? There are many publications addressing the distinguishing features in protein kinases between the active and inactive and the inactive state, not for the lipid kinases. We think that the reason is simply the higher complexity, the difficulty in determining these at the membrane. What is the mechanism of PI3K activation? As to P10 phosphatase, which dephosphorylates PIP3 back to PIP2, the opposite of PI3K. Here we asked, what is the mechanism of activation of tumor suppressor P10 at the membrane? So we were interested in elucidating P10 tumor suppressor, where we see them, and the mechanism is, has been unknown. So the auto-inhibited state, we closed, closed, because the C-terminal tail is here, phosphorylated, and the, here, the PIP2 binding domain is folded. The phosphorylation opens the tail, allowing it to bind to the membrane. And we tracked P10 from the Zwitter ionic onto the anionic membrane, which has the PIP3, because the PIP3, when it binds the P10, allosterically unfolds the PIP2 binding domain, allowing it to bind PIP2 and get it activated. Finally, we determined P10 catalytic action at the membrane. So 
Here we can see the auto inhibition of the phosphorylated P10. Oocyte, we see the tail is phosphorylated. Now, here are P10 driver mutations. And interestingly, the mutations can elicit both cancer and autism. And this is not unique to P10. <laughs> Many oncogenic proteins in the RAS signaling network, and not only there, show this particular characteristic of having mutations that elicit cancer, not necessarily autism, but neurodevelopmental dis uh, disorders. So I'm wondering how can same gene mutations promote both cancer and neurodevelopmental disorders? Symptoms of cancer are distinct from neurodevelopmental disorders, even though they may harbor same gene and even same mutations. So why mutations in the same gene can lead to such seemingly disparate phenotypes has been definitely to us. It's also been puzzling why those with neurodevelopmental disorders have a higher risk of cancer. And the proteins, as I say, that show this, uh, this particular property are diverse. Here, RAS, RO, ERK, PI3K, P10, we already mentioned it, SHIP2, and many more are among them. Others include autism, PI3K-related overgrowth syndrome, cerebral palsy, rasopathies, they have distinct uh, phenotypes, although they may also have some overlapping clinical manifestations. So we were fascinated how to link same gene mutations to neurodevelopmental disorders versus cancer, which has been enigmatic. In the literature, some publications focused on developmental disorders and the cell cycle, whereas others explored mutational properties. A decades-old attractive hypothesis argued that the primary feature distinguishing between the two types of mutations is signaling strength and duration is strong and short developmental disorders. If we can sustain, the likely outcome is and this hypothesis has been tested by phosphorylation levels, for example, for the associated ever. The linkage between a mutation and signal strength and duration and the differential clinical outcome have been elusive. And we think, we believe that the signal strength and duration are also unlikely to be in the Either one can lead already to oncogen-induced senescence. So here is an example for us. Here are the somatic mutations in RAS proteins in cancer and embryonic mutations in prosopathy. These are neurodevelopmental, so these are embryonic. So looking at these embryonic, or germline mutations may or may not be stronger. In us, they are not. Here, we looked at the cell cycle diagrams of the network. Here on the left for the wild type cell, in the middle for the cancer cell, on the right for the mutant embryonic brains. Under physiological condition, cell cycle, oncogenic condition. We know that very strong, potent, hyperactivated signaling can lead to OIS, oncogen-induced senescence, where the cell exits the, the cell cycle, permanently exits. And here, mutant embryonic brain cell. There is premature senescence, also hyperactivated signaling. So we suggested that signaling levels are critical in determining the disease consequences. And these are the outcome of four major determinants. Mutation strengths, expression levels, 
cell type and the timing window, embryonic cell or mature differentiate. For MEPK, I'm sorry, for PI3K and P10, signaling in cancer in the middle and in more developmental disorders. Here, PI3K, here on the right for P10. So we signaling levels are critical in disease consequences, and they are the outcome of mutation strengths, expression levels, mRNA expression levels cell type specificity, and the timing window, somatic versus embryonic or germline. The key issue is chromatin accessibility for the specific gene. We know embryonic cell, we know that the chromatin is highly packed. This is not the case for specific gene or, or regulatory regions for specific genes uh, in the adult differentiated cell. And in addition to the chromatin accessibility for the specific gene, we should also not forget other genes encoding other nodes in the pathway. Why? Because the signal, even if the protein is highly activated, it's the signal that it produces still needs to propagate all the, all the way down to the cell cycle and to the respective uh, transcription factor. Coming back then, I said we have been working on the KRAS, uh, on RAS, and especially focusing on KRAS phobia, not just us. It's, it's most people uh, do this. Why? Why focus on KRAS phobia? So here are the statistics of some RAS isoform mutations in human cancer, and we see how much we still do not understand. KRAS, especially KRAS for B, has over 95%, actually almost 100% incidence in pancreatic cancer. We still do not understand why. In colorectal cancer, over 45%, again, specifically KRAS or KRAS for B. We do not understand why KRAS for B and not another isoform. In lung adenocarcinoma, over 35%, again, KRAS for, for B, which we do not understand. NRAS, over 30% or 15% in AML and melanoma. Why specifically NRAS and not KRAS or HRAS? We do not understand. But HRAS is the most abundant in bladder cancer. Why specifically HRAS in bladder cancer? We do not understand. Altogether, then, looking at RAS and the signaling, RAS signaling pathways play cardinal roles, not only in cancer, but not to forget, also in inflammation and immunity, and, and, and as I just discussed, in neurodevelopmental disorder, and much is still not understood. Come back, still we don't understand why distinct KRAS mutations in the three diseases that I mentioned, colorectal, lung, and pancreatic cancer. Look at the distribution. We don't know why specifically KRAS is so frequent in lung cancer. Pancreatic cancer, why especially G12D also in colorectal cancer? Why G13D so frequent in colorectal Rectal cancer, but not in the other cancer. And of course, looking across also the same type, we see this in homogeneity. Why? We still do not understand. So here are alleles of distinct biology, and we do not understand why. Here was G12V and G12C have worse clinical outcome than G12D. We do not understand why. Keras G12D has elevated PI3K and MAPK signaling. No idea why. Keras G12C and G12V elevated RAL GDS signaling again. No idea why. And Keras G13D responds to this drug. But G12 mutants do not. We do not understand why. So we were wondering, can such questions be tackled by structures? Here we talk about structures in this symposium and 
also, though, not to forget, signaling landscapes in the different cancers, that's to say, in specific cells. Under physiological conditions, RAS is activated through incoming signals. To be activated in signal, RAS should localize to the membrane. It should undergo a GF catalyzed exchange of the GDP by GTP. It should then activate and bind effectors and to activate the MAF or MAPK uh, pathway, RAS should dimerize or form nanoclusters. Why? Because RAF is activated as a dimer. That is not the case for the PI3K and the M mTOR pathway, where RAS activates PI3K as a monomer. So here is a schematic diagram of RAS activation. And here we see the inactive state of RAS. GDP is then exchanged by GTP with the help of the change factor, Jeff. Hydrolysis with the help of the gap protein brings us back to the inactive state. Organic mutations block the gap assisted hydrolysis, leading grass in a constitutively active state. And the membrane further enhances the activity of monomeric grass. How? Any marine interaction data and simulations reveal that in solution, the effect of binding site of keras for b is auto-inhibited by its HVR. Active at the membrane, it is expressed. The HVR anchors in the membrane. So here, an overall view, schematic view of the role of the HVR in the active and inactive, inactive states of the keras for b Here, the inactive state, we see the HVR blocking the effect or binding site. GDP exchanged by GTP, we see the HVR fluctuates, allowing effect or access back to the inactive state on cogenic state. Again, the HVR fluctuates and exposing to a greater extent with the fluctuations, the, the, the access to allowing the access of the effect of SRAF, PI3K, and all others to the effect of binding site. And this is a simplified diagram in solution. At the membrane, here, RAS, we see the HVR is sandwiched between the membrane and the catalytic domain with the HVR um, blocking the effect of binding site, active at the membrane, RAS fluctuates, allowing access discussed auto-inhibition of RAS. As I mentioned, we have been over the last uh, so many, I don't know, already a couple of years, we have been very interested also in other nodes of proteins in the RAS signaling pathways. So here is BRAF. And here we looked at the auto-inhibited state of BRAF in the presence of the 1433 and the absence for lack of time, I'm not going to show that. So we modeled it. The structure was unavailable at the time that we started in the middle as we were working on it. The papers by Michael Eck and John Kurian came out, cryo uh, structures. We were very happy. Uh, the, there was very good correspondence. Still, we also took the cryo -EM structures and uh, simulated them as well. What in the cryo -EM, though, the RBD, the RAS binding domain, was not there because it did not, it was fluctuating. There was no clear density for it. Of course, the simulations were able to find the, the most populated state. What then the structures showed is that the, what is the role of the 1433? First, I would say it stabilizes the auto inhibited state of the BRAF. On its own, 
Without the 1433, there was no crystal structure and no cryo M structure. As I said, with simulations, we were able to obtain it and get again the populated state. The 1433 also blocks the BRAF dimer interface. KD is the kinase domain. We see that the kinase domain interacts with the 1433, and it covers also the surface of the membrane binding region of the CRD, the cysteine rich domain. So, what we have done, we took this structure and the structure in the absence of the 1433 and together constructed the activation of RAF from the inactive to the active state. And here we see how RAF's side-to-side -side dimerization promotes the off to on transition. Here, observed an intra um, intra stacking, intra pi pi stacking in the monomer, which is substituted by the stacking, by the pi pi stacking, which is intermolecular for this is the kinase domain, stabilizing the kinase domain dimer and through releasing the alpha helix, promoting the off to on transition. Finally, the last slide, I don't see here the time, but I'm assuming I'm, it's, I'm, I hope I'm not exceeding it here, just to show also the PI3K, the lipid kinase, we have been fascinated by it. And when we started, it's the, the beginning of it, we were just wondering how is the lipid kinase activated here? We see the ATP, the gamma phosphate, this is the tip of the PIP2. That this phosphate has to be transferred to the tip of the PIP2 to produce the PIP3 signaling lipid. However, in the inactive state that we constructed from different PDB structures and some modeling and putting it together, the distance was six to seven angstrom, which is much too far from a phosphoryl transfer. In the simulations, what we observed is a conformational change upon the NSH2 release and leading to a distance of one to three angstroms, allowing, of course, the drop. And with this, I shall close and acknowledge my colleagues on the top here, the group in Frederick, uh, Hyun Bam, Zen, Tsai, Ryan and Yonglan, my long time collaborators in Koch University, Osle Matila, and here one of the students, Serena, in Shanghai, Xiaoyong, and uh, Jian Zheng, and of course, Vadim Gaponenko and his students provided NMR data, wonderful collaborators, additional collaborators in Frederick, Carla, and University of Maryland, and Lately, the last couple of years, also with the Cleveland Clinic, Karis Eng, Fai Xiong Cheng, and Iris. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth. And I think your talk really illustrates how with simulation and, and modeling, you can take the various structures available in the PDB and enable an understanding of an extremely complex network, extremely complex system. Um, and so I think it's a it's it's a, a, a tremendously a tremendous example of being able to do that. Um, so that's beautiful. Uh, I do have a couple of questions here in the chat. So one, uh, uh, Enrique Balderas Angelis asks: Is it possible to detect or use RAS mutations as biomarkers for cancer? To detect which mutations? Uh, detect RAS mutations. With biomarkers, since I'm not expert, I, I do not want to commit. I think they do this through the uh, through the activity. The activity. I no. think so I think it is that's what, that's what I would think. This is the, what I know. Unless I'm missing something, uh, you simply see you you measure MAPK, PI three K. Uh, you know, usually people measure MAPK. Um, so RAS is typically called the classic non-druggable target 
But now uh, there is some advances in drugs uh, to inhibit activation of RAS, inhibit activated RAS. So could you kind of briefly say why would people feel this is an undruggable target and what was the secret to being able to make it druggable? So first of all, I would say it's not yet completely druggable, right? It's druggable for one mutation and still experiments and efforts are going on for several other mutations. The main issue to begin with is the surface of rust, of rust, no real cavities to speak on. There were very, you know, the cavities are shallow and the one that was there was the one for GTP, which has extremely high affinity to GTP. So it's practically, uh, it's impossible to compete. The, the way that uh, Kevin, Kevin Shokat finally brilliantly, I mean, it's really brilliantly overcame the problem for the, for the G12C, it's a cysteine. So covalent linkage. Mm -hmm. it, and as we know, people are trying, I know, for example, with a tyrosine, trying again to link a covalent uh, to tyrosine and to other and to other possible uh, locations. And of course, in Vienna also, they have been trying, uh, you know, a pharmaceutical company have been trying to, to drug the uh, near the dimeric binding site, which we actually predicted, Hyun Bam predicted that particular conformation. Uh, so, but that one, at least from what I know, uh, you know, has has still not advanced. People are trying uh, monobodies, etc., different approaches. What I find most interesting and important to highlight is, and we published this in Cell Chemical Biology in 2021, is uh, that what and RAS is just one ex such example, is that it is not whether you target the, the inactive or the active state that works. It's what one has to do is to target the activation mechanism. This is the key. In RAS, the mutation that worked did not speak, because we know, I mean, it targets the inactive state, the G12C. But the key is that it blocks the activation mechanism. So the activation mechanism, as I mentioned, is either the exchange <laughs> hydrolysis for the G12C, specifically it's hydrolysis. And so it blocks the hydrolysis. Uh, this is not the case most of the time, not most of the time for kinases. So kinases, we know, because again, you target the, the activation state. So there, it's the, the energy landscape, the population, and the allosteric. allosteric. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. So um, that was really beautiful. And um, I, so now in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next presentation. Thank you.